um, I was I was called here today to talk about um, adventure, and it's an article I wrote about adventure. So uh, this article ar arose from an interesting discussion, and it was basically: Is there a deeper meaning to adventure? Was there ever a deep, deeper purpose behind adventure? And um, what we found was very interesting. Uh, just organized sports and adrenaline junkies running from one com competition to another. Was there something, a deeper purpose behind the word adventure? And um, so we, we started with our little research. We got into research a little more. And uh, we found a very interesting storyline. And the whole storyline, first of all, begins with um, perspective. And um, what better place to start than the blue marble? This was um, the first clear picture of planet Earth taken by during the Apollo mission. And um, they were very lucky on that day. The Earth was fairly cloudless. And so mankind got their first glimpse at a clear picture of the planet they lived on. And um, so this was the beginning of perspective and a picture of the actual planet from space that we never had before. But take many thousands of years ago, and perspective still mattered. This is supposed to be one of the earliest maps ever made, and if you see, it's made on, it's not even on parchment, it's been made on a carving on stone. And this was taken during the Babylonian Empire. And as you can see, though it almost is nothing, um, it still depicts what man at that point perceived of their surroundings. Though it may be just a few hectares of land, it's still perceived, I mean, and as time went on, we had different maps. So this one is called the Martellus map, this was in, Around 14, the late 1400s, um, you can see there's been so many, so many developments from the last map to this one. Um, you can always see somehow in all the maps, Sri Lanka is clearly pointed out right there. Um, the Silk Route, the very important road joining um, Asia, or Europe to Asia, that's been clearly depicted. Though, as you can see from clear conjecture, there are no different continents. There is um, no, there's no, there's very little shown of the Southern Hemisphere, no Antarctica, no Australia. There's a crude uh, depiction of what a Africa does look like. But you can see there's, there's a lot of development. And though there was tons of conjecture, their guess was pretty accurate. Um, now, well, in my research, we kind of caught a weird storyline. We had to put in and fill it in with a little guesswork here and there. But it all started with this map. This was Ptolemy's world map. And um, what happened with this map, it was the first, it was a very important, it was like the fulcrum of cartography and map making, because this was the first map that actually combined geography and mathematics to make something which was kind of practically applicable. Um, though this was in around 150 AD, which is a really long time ago, Ptolemy managed to use meridians which today we know as latitudes. And they're very clearly depicted here in lines. He also insanely, though it was 150 AD, had somehow sussed out trade winds. And if you look in the, in the corners, I don't know if you guys can make out, but they're actual men's faces blowing wind. And that was to demarcate the trade winds. And this was all in 150 AD. Now, it was fantastic for the time, but he did make a, one small mistake, which we'll come to later. Um, now, what happened after Ptolemy? For years, things went on, you know? There was no real need to discover geographically because of the Silk Route. The Silk Route en enabled um, us to, for, I mean, Europe to meet Asia. They, there was trade started in spices, in condiments, in garments, and silk, and um, the exotic materials of the Orient became an almost vital demand to Europe. Now, for years, this went on, and Europe's need for spices and garments and everything was satisfied. But what happened was, um, in about the early 1100s, the Silk Route collapsed. I mean, Genghis Khan came around, the Ottoman Empire grew, and they shut down the Silk Route once and for all. They wanted to control all the trade themselves, obviously. So, thus began the mad rush to find a maritime and a sea route to Asia and the Orient, because the demand for spices never did die, I only grew. And enter Chris Columbus, one of the most, the, the premier expeditioner and adventurer. He set sail, and believe it or not, 
using Ptolemy's map, which was made all those thousands of years ago, even from when he left, he set sail in about the late 1400s. And he set sail with, with only one mission in mind, to find, to find India, to find the Orient, and open up another route where trade was possible. So he set off, he hit land, which as we all know, he believed, and believed solidly to be, um, to be India, and therefore he called it the Indies. He came back, he had to go back and establish himself, so he told everyone that I, I found India, I found Asia, but he met stiff opposition right in the beginning from the church, because the church still believed at that time that the world was flat. And before he could even reach the question of India or America, they cut him out because they said, we're of an opposing view, you can't, you're saying the earth is round, we're saying the world is still flat, so it was ridiculous. He didn't find funding, he didn't find sponsorship anywhere. But finally, the then Queen of Spain, Queen Isabella, finally funded him, and he went back with his three ships, he found America again, and he came back and he insisted that it was still Asia. He had found, he was convinced it was Asia. Though what happened was, around that time, another traveler called Amerigo Vespucci, he, it was around the same time, and he set off, and he sailed west instead of east, he took a different route, and he came as well to America. Now, he knew it was America, he knew it wasn't Asia. He came on the other coast, he landed, he found the Amazon, he found Rio, he landed in Central America and went right down the coast, and he came back and established, luckily, that this America was, in fact, a separate landmass. Now, in 1507, which was not far after, a German cartographer, Mr. Walsi Muller, with Vespucci's findings, had the first map that indicated America as a separate landmass. Now, as you guys can see here on the left, that's America as a separate landmass, though it's nothing like what we know of it today. It's just a sliver which also very interestingly indicates that this is all Vespucci discovered. This is all the places where Vespucci went, and this is what he knew of America. But this was the first practically applicable, ma applicable map, uh, professionally acknowledged map the world had ever seen. Um, now, while everything was going on in ge with geography at that time, there were massive advancements, huge jumps in geography being made. Um, while all this was going on, um, man still was still massively in the dark when it comes to um, his surroundings, his natural environment, the planet he lived on and how it worked. Um, a lot of big questions were left explained and were explained by religion and people left it at that, you know, God, divine intervention. But then we had Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, a pioneer in his, in his, in his own right, he set off again around the same time from Europe and went out on a single mission not to discover and not to take in land, but to shed light on these important questions like birth, death, reproduction, where we're all from. And he, observing this micro e e uh, ecosystem in the Galapagos, he observed the Galapagos tortoise, as you can see, and all the things working in absolute harmony, like a well-oiled machine. And he said, no, there's, there's no way we were divinely, divinely put on this earth just one day, no flash in the pan. It was a long and tedious process of evolution. He came back, was widely criticized as a heretic. Um, in, people insisted the church was completely against him, obviously, and still would be. But he then became the power of the theory of evolution and natural selection and the survival of the fittest. So he was another con contributor during this time. A very close confidant and a friend of Darwin, this guy called Thomas Huxley, he said, and he had a fantastic quote that in my research, I managed to dig out. And I find it not only reflects um, the character of Darwin, but of all these people we've spoken of, all these people of illimitable curiosity who, who went out of their way, who traveled into the unknown to shed that little more light on, on what we know, on what the hu humankind as a race is aware of. And so what he talks of in this quote is that it's every man's duty to take that little bit and to, to shed that little more light on a little more unknown in his lifetime. It's his duty to discover that little more, to be able to enlighten the human race just a little bit because there's such an unlimited sea of the unknown, an unlimited ocean of the unknown. And this not only reflects on Charles Darwin, but I think of all the people we've spoken of, they seem to have the same innate, innate quality ingrained in them. Um, now, another thing, another very peculiar, very peculiar 
connection is all these guys we spoke of, whether it's Vespucci, whether it was um, Columbus, whether it was Shackleton, they all had very similar names to their ships. It was Discovery, Endurance, Resolution. These ships, sometimes both of them had ships named Adventure. I think Darwin, Darwin and Cook, Captain Cook, um, who was the person who discovered Australia, New Zealand, and the Hawaiian Islands as late as the 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s, all of them had names. And this shows where their focus lay as individuals, what, what drove them, what got them out of bed every morning and go into places that no one had dreamed of then. Um, moving on to someone else, this guy's Ernest Shackleton. The most, in all my research, this was, I think, one of the coolest things we stumbled upon. It was a little clipping, and it's a real clipping from a newspaper, um, of Ernest, uh, an ad by Ernest Shackleton in a London newspaper um, asking for help, asking for, um, uh, for people who, uh, like an application for employment. And um, as you can see, it, it's absolutely nonsensical. All they're offering is honor, I think, and recognition for hazardous wages. This is a real clipping. Hazardous wages, bitter cold. I mean, it's ridiculous. Why would anyone want this job? But the fact is, it, people like this, people who did it for nothing except for the sheer curiosity of it and to find out what they didn't know, that took stuff like this and went ahead with it. And Shackleton was probably the the, uh, he was a cherry atop this age of discovery where everyone went out and took in new lands and discovered new lands and he made four voyages to the, uh, to the Antarctic all in the early 1900s, very early, between 1900 and 1903. He made these three or four voyages to the Antarctic and he has the, was then the person to go furthest towards the South Pole, the actual South Pole. He reached 88 degrees south latitude which is a mere 180 kilometers away from the South Pole. And in those times, that was unheard of. I mean, through lots of sacrifice and hardship, but he managed it. And, um, sorry. Yeah, so, I mean, what I got and what I took out of all this at the end of it was, again, we come back to perception. Um, we, I mean, humankind always thinks they know everything in the present. Now, a few hundred years ago, we were convinced the Earth was flat. After that, uh, before that, we were convinced the sun um, revolved around the earth. And we, were, we knew so many things. We currently believe we are alone and we know we're alone in the universe. But the fact is, before we look up towards the stars, there's so much to discover down here. There's so much. You guys know that ter the terrestrial landmass of our whole planet is only 30%. 70% is still the ocean. 70% is water. Out of which, it's very, it's said that 90% is not even been discovered. Forget mapped, it's never been, it's never gone to, it's never been discovered. And here a very famous marine biologist, Dr. Sylvia Earle, she says a very similar thing. She says, before we, before we look up to Mars and we look to Jupiter and we look to Pluto, there's just so much still here to discover. The oceans are absolutely dark still to humankind, much like most of the Earth was years ago. Um, so finally, we come back to the same thing, perception, and my, the qu answer to my question, did adventure have a deeper purpose? Was it more than just, was it more than just a question, I mean, you know, like organized sport and these unreasonable sounding adrenaline junkies? And the truth was, adventure does have a deeper purpose, and this storyline we managed to patch together kind of indicated the same, that it was because of these few standout individuals, these pioneers, these people of illim illimitable curiosity that kind of charted hum the humans, humankind's history, the world's evolution, not the Earth's, but the world's. That's how human beings perceive it. And it was up to them. You, you think, what, what, would be, what would be the state of our map today without people as such as this? So I finally found the answer to my question, and um, I was lucky enough that my article got published and we put together this little cover and it became the cover article for the first issue of the magazine. We have the Galapagos tortoise and Ptolemy's map and um, by a very talented artist and illustrator, Anjana K. And so this became the first thing and I found my answer to the question, does adventure have a purpose? Thanks. I'm done.